So hi, everybody, and welcome to our presentation, Authentic and Emerging, Understanding the Context of Your School Design Project. We really appreciate your time and energy during this virtual A4 Elite Association Days conference. Our presentation was originally meant to be a panel discussion followed by an interactive work workshop. And so that we don't completely lose the intention of how we set this up, what we did was formatted the presentation to include a short introduction of the topics and central project to be discussed, followed by the panel discussion and concluding with a self-directed workshop in the form of a short survey. At the end of the presentation, we're hoping you're going to be able better able to strategically investigate the authentic and emerging context of your district, your school, your project, and then articulate, prioritize, and equitably apply um, those contexts. We're also hoping you'll be able to better able to recognize and cyclically apply those contexts um, in as, best, as new best practices come out in education and educational design. Our panel today is made up of Executive Director Chuck Jackson and Chief Academic Officer Niam Kalong of Creative Minds International Public Charter School and Principal Stephen Orlansky of Newman Architects. I'm Rachel Pampel, an educational planner from Newman Architects, and I will be introducing our background information and then moderating the panel. We're going to start by reviewing a few of our core beliefs, tools, and resources around how Newman approaches K-12 design, and then we're going to dive into an overview of the Creative Minds a renovation project that we recently completed with Chuck and Nyamka. So to start an education design project, we always start with the basics, defining our terms. What is a learning environment and what is a good learning environment are key to clarify with your team early on in the design process. We believe that a good learning environment is one that takes into account authentic and emerging contexts. This is unique to every situation and is a carefully developed blend of a project's immediate needs and larger scale best practices. So what we mean by authentic is true to the practical situation and goals of a project. By emerging, we mean a project has to be open to change and self-motivated to grow. And by context, we mean the holistic setting of the learning process. To find these authentic and emerging contexts, we're going to be looking at the uh, six perspectives of the learning environment and the 10 characteristics of a good learning environment. So the six perspectives of the learning environment is a scaffold of discovery of the authentic and emerging context of a project. It looks at six overlapping factors in a school design from a range of scales. The perspectives are mental and ideal, community and reach, physical and architectural, functional and operational, users and roles, and time and dynamic. Each perspective encourages encourages us to ask key and defining questions about a project's context. So how do we think about and in the learning environment? How do we physically interact with and in the learning environment? Um, who are the invi individuals that are in our learning environment and how do they interact? Where is the learning environment located from all perspectives? What are the meta processes and goals of the learning environment? And when is the learning environment from all perspectives and how, will it, how does it and how will it change? The 10 characteristics of a good learning environment are our data-driven global best practices that we've developed from a wide range of academic and practice-based resources. The characteristics are activity, adaptability, atmosphere, community, collaboration, emerging contexts, nature, orientation, pedagogy, and accessibility. This list is used as a guide early in the design process to set goals and priorities for the built learning environment, as well as the design process itself. All learning environments don't necessarily have all of these characteristics, but they are what is seen consistently as part of, of a holistic good learning environment in the research that we've looked at. So we're gonna be using the Creative Minds International Renovation Project as the core project during our panel discussion. This renovation included a 6,000 square foot his, um, renovation in a historic federal building in Washington, DC. The program was to develop classrooms, resource rooms, and a central learning commons that spanned the entirety of the building's ground floor, as well as pursuing targeted safety and security improvements throughout the building. Along with these tangible goals, we also worked to define a design vision for the future of the school. So as part of that process, we developed what we called a scope and priority summary. Working with the core planning group, we collaboratively developed both the scope of the work to be implemented immediately and the scope of the work that was envisioned for the future. 
So after developing the scope for each floor of the building, we developed a list of opportunities presented and constraints inherent to each item. And then we prioritized each item on the list based on a balance of what was most important and what was most feasible for a limited schedule and budget. This scope and priorities in hand, we worked through a community engagement process consisting of several in-person meetings, digital surveys, and in-person questionnaires with students, staff, and teachers to determine the design values and goals of each group. The design team then consolidated these findings from the engagement into an executive summary that was presented at an academic and operational team design charrette. For this design charrette, the design team facilitated a day-long event with the school leadership where we revisited the scope and priority summaries, the community engagement executive summary, and then dived into a discussion around curriculum and space design. Key to this process was several passes at the core question of what is a good learning environment. And we started with what is a learning environment and then moved on to what is a good learning environment for CNI, CMI, uh, for Creative Minds. So remembering again that what is a good learning environment is a unique answer to every situation. The findings from this design threat were then used to fine tune the scope and priority summary and led directly to the design guidelines for the project. These four design guidelines were collaboratively developed throughout the early parts of the design process and defined the design moves in the floors, ceilings, and walls of the spaces to be renovated. So these guidelines are reinforcing activity zones through FF&E and interior finishes, domesticating the learning environment, using line and plane to delineate and activate flexible environments, and using color um, and materials to advance wayfinding and orientation. Uh, so we consider this project really to be a prime example of how effective community engagement and values-driven design processes can yield big results even on a tight budget. And so we're just gonna take a quick look at some before and after slides before diving into the panel discussion. So here you can see the before and after of the core of the learning commons. And here you see the transformation of the classroom spaces. This is the entrance lobby and primary community space within the ground floor commons. And so now we're gonna to move to the panel discussion with our three panelists. We have four main questions that we're gonna structure the dialogue. Um, and I'm gonna start with letting the panelists introduce themselves as uh, to get us going. So uh, Stephen, do you wanna start? Sure, thank you, Rachel. I'm Stephen Orlansky, a principal with Newman Architects, and I've had the privilege of being involved in the design of schools now for over 20 years. Um, I work with public school districts, uh, with independent and charter schools like Creative Minds, um, as well as with institutions of higher education. One of the great uh, benefits of being involved in school design is that it supports my uh, uh, personal aspiration to be a lifelong learner. And from no one do I learn more than from communities that care. So community engagement is a passion of mine and, and one of the great joys and fulfillments of being involved in this field. Thanks, Stephen. You wanna do Chuck and then Iamka? <clears throat> Thanks, Rachel. Hey, Stephen, it's good to see you. Um, we're really excited as a school to be involved in this project. Um, we really enjoyed working with you all at Newman. So, um, I am a recovering attorney, so I practiced law for many years, and then about 15 years ago, I woke up and realized that education was a better solution to problems. So I've been in education for over 15 years, been here at Creative Mind for a little over two years. Uh, in all that experience, I've started a school, I've closed a school, I've uh, renovated several schools, I built one new school building. Um, I was also at DCPS as a Deputy Chief of Operations for a while before I came back into charters. And um, I was very excited to work with Newman about on this project. And I'm sitting in one of the spaces right now. It's beautiful. And uh, we look forward to sharing our, our experience with you all. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. My name is Nayamka Long, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Creative Minds. Um, and we were excited to partner with Newman to design this very beautiful space for our students. Um, I have been working in education for over the past 15 years and worked in various settings, uh, public, charter, uh, private, and the 
thing that I love about it is that in all those different settings, you know, kids always bring such excitement and, um, and love of learning to an environment. And so as we kind of think about designing environments, we want to kind of take what students bring in and also set the settings up to be really um, an integral part of their learning experience. So uh, that's something that is always front of mind as I'm always looking to do what, what can we do to kind of support students learning um, and just you know, instilling that growth mindset in them that they're lifelong learners. Um, so we're just excited about this opportunity to answer some questions um, and look forward to diving in. Awesome. Thank you all so much. You did a much better uh, job introducing yourselves than I would have. It would have been dry. Um, so the way that we've set the, the set the panel up is uh, the reason that we gave you the introduction to the Creative Minds Project is it's obviously the one that we have the most familiarity with, but we're also going to be looking for our panel to give us some background on their other experiences, how they contrasted, how they compared to this specific project and what its authentic and emerging contexts were. So our first question for the panel is, uh, what was most surprising to you during your school design processes? And like I said, this is a question about the CMI project, the Creative Minds project, obviously, but also about any other project that it might connect to in your mind because it's so different or because it's so similar. Um, Chuck, you wanna start us off? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um... As I mentioned in my intro, I have been involved in renovating other schools and building brand new buildings. And uh, and I thought I think the key difference in this experience for me was the level of engagement in the process and the level of engagement of the community. So certainly when I was at central office at DCPS, it was definitely a top-down experience. It was, this is an old school, we're deciding to renovate it and we will select the architect and you will enjoy it, teachers, students, and all that. Um, and what I really liked here, and one of the things I really liked about Creative Minds and why I think we had such a strong partnership with Newman was it was more of a bottom-up experience. Um, those guiding questions, the elements, you really did a nice job of facilitating the process where now people walk in here and say, oh, I remember when we picked that. Oh yeah, I remember we decided to paint that wall that color. Um, and I think that made a big difference. Um, the other thing that I was really impressed by in this process was we are in a historic building. So there's a lot of hoops we have to jump through with SHPO and with our friends at Department of Defense and all that good stuff. Plus we're part of a bigger community uh, with the residents who live here at the Armed Forces Retirement Home. And so we did have to be conscious of all that and um, that helped make it a more effective process, again, because we were aware of that, we engaged them early on, and they were more like partners versus contrarians throughout the process. So I appreciated that. That was a surprise. Yeah. Um, and it awesome. came in on time and on budget, which was another big surprise, <laughs> to be honest. Um, that's only happened in one other project I've worked on. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chuck. Nayamka, what about what's your perspective as, as the chief academic officer? And you kind of came in and out of the core planning group. You were part of the main design shred, also a part of some of the interviews with the teachers. What was surprising for you in the process? I think one of the big surprises and is that when we thought when you think about school, you automatically think about books. And being in this historic space, we there weren't like a lot of bookshelves and things that were already incorporated in this space. And so we really wanted to be intentional about, you know, presenting opportunities for students to just, you know, walk down the hall and pick up a book. And so that was something that was really missing in our previous space and something that we really wanted to incorporate to just kind of show that, you know, we don't want to feel that they have to go to this one space to get books or to continue their learning, but it's something that's throughout our space and easily accessible to all and inviting and, you know, they can visibly see the books that are there and not just the side of the book. So they can, you know, wonder what it is, but the books are just kind of like jumping out to them. And that was something that is really exciting as you think about, you know, opening opportunities for students to continue their learning. So that was something that we wanted and we were able to get it. Awesome. Cool. Well, and Stephen, what's your perspective from like the meta level, um, thinking about your interactions with this project and then also how it compares to others? I think what Chuck referred to as um, kind of the experts coming to do a school project, and those experts might be people such as ourselves, architects, engineers who have expertise in uh, school planning and in construction processes. 
as well as the expertise of administration and uh, honestly, even faculty sometimes. Um, I think for me, what is uh, maybe less surprising at this point, but was surprising to me at one point, um, was just how much very important knowledge resides with engaged communities that the experts such as ourselves just don't have. And uh, I think that finding that appropriate balance where we're showing up together with school administrators and district folks as subject matter experts, but also recognizing that communities are truly the experts in their own daily lives um, is really kind of the big learning for me. Um, so one example of that that I'd, uh, I'd call a wonderful surprise, and this is actually an experience with DCPS as well, um, there was a school project we were involved with that, you know, by by all uh, obvious indicators was just a school project. This was a building that was built in the 1960s, not very exciting. It had deteriorated, it needed to be modernized. Okay, you just come in, you do a school project. In engaging with its community, um, kind of in the way that we're gonna talk about today, what we learned um, is that the school site actually had an incredibly deep history going back to the time of the Civil War and uh, in that engagement and in that learning, um, this project became more than just, you know, a modernized school building. It became a site with um, incredibly deep meaning that was expressed through uh, a public, an award-winning public art program um, that um, now the community and really anybody visiting the site uh, will experience in a very, very different way. Um, so that would be an example of a wonderful surprise that came out of um, truly engaging and respecting um, what people who have lived in a neighborhood for a long time brought to the table that we just didn't have access to prior. Mm. Nice. So that kind of, oh, go ahead, Nayaka. I was going to share another um, thing that sounds surprising is, you know, when we were kind of doing the design charrettes is, you know, realizing how intentional, like you have, to, or how oh, so many factors that have to be considered as you're thinking about designing a space um, and how intentional you have to be. And we thought it was important to kind of go back to our mission and think, oh, what are the things that we want to, you know, say about our space and, you know, thinking about that creative piece and really um, kind of forced us to be intentional about the colors that we chose um, for the design, the furniture. Um, we're all about, you know, students being creative and we didn't want to just have one set seating area for students. We wanted to kind of just have this flexible seating where some students can sit on cushions, some can sit in a chair, you can stand. So having multiple options like that, um, whereas it, it didn't initially, you know, have us think about that, but in, in through the design, really being intentional about what we wanted to create in this space and then taking those designs and these are the different things that we can do with that was really fun and exciting um, to do. Awesome. I was just gonna, um, this is, this. obviously we set it up this way, but this transitions us nicely to our next question, which is, um, you know, what, what do you all feel like were the most crucial discoveries that you made during both the Creative Minds process and other projects you've been um, involved in, not just, as we were, you know, doing the design and, and developing the building, but also, and we'll touch on this more heavily later, but, you know, think a little bit at least about um, how it's been getting into the spaces and, and uh, what you might be considering it with a, as a post occupancy and, you know, especially given that the project was intended to set up a vision for the future. What were you discovering that set, you, that set us up in the design process and then also going forward? I guess I have to pick somebody. <laughs> Chuck, you look, you look ready. <laughs> I was about to say, you might want to go to Niamka first, uh, but I'll jump in. Um, I, I think it was, you know, it was a really interesting time for us to do a design and a renovation because we were also going through strategic planning. And the discoveries that came through both processes were so wonderfully aligned, which I think was a big surprise. But it was because of the process of both and they kind of mirrored each other and they're definitely walk, walking in lockstep in parallel that I felt like we got a really strong sense of vision. So one example, just a silly example, but, and Nayaka alludes to this, we used to refer to ourselves as CMI. Now we call ourselves creative minds. That's a, you know, and that's become the way our eighth grade president in his speech when he graduated said, the pandemic forced us to not just go to creative minds, but be creative minds. And so it's kind of taking hold. Um, and I think because of 
the process that allowed it to get a really good start. It, um, and so that was a really pleasant discovery for me, I think, um, just to sort of, that's my first gut reaction. I would say another discovery is just thinking about the color choices that we kind of went with and, you know, how some colors, you know, cause you to have a little more excitement and, you know, elude or elicit different feelings in our students. And we, you know, um, oftentimes you see like super bright colors, like the red, orange, yellow, green. And, you know, sometimes those can really get students excited. Um, but like, we want to kind of strike that balance between, you know, not overstimulating because we also realize that if there's too many things happening in the classroom that, that causes um, distraction. And we really want to minimize that, but then also make the space feel bright and welcome. So trying to, you know, strike that balance between um, the design process there. Yeah, and I, I was going to add, um, at being a part of the design team for this, I think, you know, the before and after pictures don't really give you what you think it is, but our, our deep dive into acoustics, um, we had an acoustic consultant for the project. Uh, he came and he walked with us. He was like, whoa, this is a wild building for a school. You know, you've got 20 foot ceilings in some places and lots and lots of hard surfaces. Um, so I think that deep dive, you know, the difference between walking down the hall uh, when before we did any work and then now with the um, uh, tectum treatments and the uh, resilient floor with acoustic underlay treatments, just it's it's wild, um, and I I love I love that you know we always keep coming back to that one of the forefront pieces for creative minds is inclusion a inclusive education, and I just think that with the color choices and the material palette and um, that those really big changes in acoustic uh, uh, effectiveness, I think they're just they're so exciting, and I think it's like a late discovery for me because like it, it's it's kind of a oh obviously you have an acoustic consultant and you do the things but as we talked and we had the strategic uh, plan and we were conversing about what do you really want for your students I think that was something that we fell into deep diving that that was a really excellent discovery that's going to be supporting like all the change all the changes and and uh, work that you might do later and then I wanted to touch back on what Chuck was saying um in terms of of overlapping with the strategic plan, Stephen. I think you've probably experienced that um, both ways a few times that sometimes the strategic plan is happening and you try and integrate it. Sometimes it's happening and it's just a completely separate process. Um, what, what do you think are the positives and negatives and discoveries that people might make by overlapping strategic planning and um, I guess almost strategic planning and design? Did we lose you, Stephen? Oh. Was that a question for me? Um, I, I think what I would say is kind of a continual discovery, if you will, for me, is just how much there is to learn. And so, you know, when I think about the projects we've worked on where those processes overlap, I think one of the lessons I take from that is that it's kind of like the more people you speak to and the more voices you bring to the table, you're likely to only discover more, more things that will enrich your project and your process. And I think really the big lesson for me about communication generally is that sometimes um, I think uh, we encounter a kind of fear, uh, a fear of either giving communities, uh, I don't know, too much voice, who, what might they demand if we allow them to speak. Um, you know, or or fear of kind of losing control of a process and not being able to maintain budgets and schedules. And uh, really uh, what I found, um, and, and really I think it's very beautiful, is that I, I do believe uh, we've proven that it's possible to um, set and maintain parameters on all kinds of things, budget, schedule, educational delivery, you know, whatever the parameters might be, and still give people a voice. And by doing that, you allow for these discoveries that can enrich um, and also uh, do what Chuck was referring to earlier, which is create a real sense of ownership. And so, you know, the question here was, what is the crucial discovery? So this may be a little bit of an oddball thing, but my crucial discovery on our most recent project in Baltimore is that even the people who are very much opposed to the project and don't get what they want can still become 
supporters of the project just because you've allowed them to engage, speak their piece, make their case, be treated with respect, and you know have the response of, you know, I hear you, and you know because of these reasons, it's not we really can't do what it is that you're asking for as an individual. Um, so in the case of Baltimore, this one person I'm thinking of was just a very, very colorful and very loud character, um, not politically correct or polite in any sense of the word. And in the end, he was a friend. So that's my, my big discovery about engaging communities. That's great. On the more specific side, Nayamka, I was I wanted to I was thinking back when we did the design threat and we were presenting the community engagement um, executive summary and especially around talking to your staff and talking to your teachers um, about what they want and what they'd like and how they you know the kind of spaces they'd like to see and there was some surprise around um, the idea of like collaboration spaces and breakout spaces um, so I was just wondering you know. You, there was a moment of surprise, but there were some things you've probably heard from your staff before. What are the conversations going on now? Um, like, what what are they maybe seeing when they're in these new spaces that that they're enjoying or feel ownership in, or have or have ideas for how you could improve in the future? Yeah, so we've had nothing but great feedback from the staff around the new spaces and everyone. We want the whole building to look like um, these identified spaces that we have um, started to embark on. Um, I think a big takeaway was, you know, being in this historic building, it wasn't designed for a school. And so it was like, people would have to find like a closet to work with a student or to collaborate with a co-teacher. And now we have these very intentional spaces where they're out in the open. You're not kind of like <laughs> hidden in a corner or something like that. You can be really intentional about meeting space um, and then also, I think that also creates this kind of learning environment where the students can walk by and see teachers working together, collaborating, and kind of goes back to our personal goals where we're, you know, want to create this collaborative spirit among our team, but then also showing that our teachers are still working together to learn and to ensure that they're planning engaging lessons for students. Um, so I think that was exciting to be able to hear that from our teachers and then be able to deliver on that. Um, which is going to help their practice, um, you know, be, you know, better educate our students. So that was exciting to see. Thanks so much. Chuck, did you want to add anything to that before we move to our next question? Cool. <laughs> um, so our next question, we've been talking a lot about in, internally, what, what did we discover? What was surprising to us? But what do you all think is most important for other people doing school design projects to ask and to know um, so that they can find their authentic and emerging context and do successful projects for their specific situation? Um, Chuck, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um... It harkens back a lot on some of the themes that we've been talking about. We've talked a lot about context. We've talked about community. We've talked about process. You know, in my experience, schools are most successful when they have a clear sense of who they are and how they want to work with kids and engage their community. Um, and that, you know, some, that doesn't mean there's one perfect model for every school. I happen to think Creative Minds is about as good as it can get, but I do think there's other schools that are affected by other measures. Um, but it is that ability to identify that, to be able to state it, um, make it a shared belief, a shared context. And then, um, then you take sort of your view of where you're sitting, what it looks like and who you're serving and how does that impact sort of the kind of school you wanna run and the kind of kids you're gonna serve. And it becomes this beautiful melting pot into something that, um, Sounds like it'd be really messy, but it was actually really clear in the end. Um, and I think a school has to be willing to get messy a little bit in order to find the order and the chaos. Um, uh, so there's uh, an analogy I use all the time. It's like, I love jazz music. I love jazz music because you can always hear the melody in it, even though there's all the riffing going on around it. There's that central force that's guiding the song forward. And if you approach a school design project and whether it's a strategic design project like we did, um, if you constantly keep that melody in there, you can let everybody riff around you. And each of that riffs is gonna make the song a little bit better and a little bit more enjoyable for everybody and they'll take ownership. Um, so I think 
if I were to advise a school or a school district, or if I could go back in time and you know, redo some of the buildings I've done before, I would say, take a good look in the mirror and then invite other people into the room and then have a really open, transparent dialogue. Um, it may take a little longer, but in the end, it's gonna be a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't do that, it's just gonna feel like school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't have the best reputations. <laughs> um, so do what you can to make it a place that welcomes people. So right. That's the advice I give someone. Nice. Namka, I'd love to hear your thoughts on both what Chuck said and also um, how, what your advice specifically might be to uh, students and teachers that are engaging in this process and also other people that are in a similar position to you uh, with the chief academic officer just duties and, and looking at curriculum and trying to make a consistent you know, central theme of, of maintaining it. What do you think is really key, um, both from what Chuck was saying for the overarching and the, the big picture, but also for students and teachers and people who are trying to manage the operations of the building day by day? Yeah, I think when you, it's definitely important to engage the community because you want everyone to kind of have this buy-in, not that you have to go with everyone's decision, but like <laughs> allowing a space for them to kind of share the ideas. And then always keeping it kind of in line with what your mission and vision is for the school, because I think that is what kind of takes that um, piece out where it's 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 not personal that we're not going the direction that you are suggesting, but it's more this is how we're staying in line with what our um, vision and mission are. So keeping that kind of as a forefront as the mm -hmm. You know, you can take all the suggestions, but keeping that as mind is this is where we're trying to move forward towards, um, and we're going to consider all of these things. But our you know determining factors are going to go back to that very specific um, mission and driven, and I think that really is keeps it kind of um, not judgmental. So it's like people don't have their feelings hurt when their you know um, idea is not considered or not considered, but not um, part of the plan. Because it's transparent. That makes sense. I was um I was gonna yeah bounce to Stephen. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say I I want to come off what uh, Nyamko was saying that I think that there's some um, I think there's like a beautiful balance that can be achieved, you know, on 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 kind of one wrong end of the balance is saying I I can't hear what these other people might say because they're gonna get me off track. The other side is. Uh, you know, not being able to say or not being able to filter uh, between the ideas that are aligned with the bigger vision, you know, and and ones that have to be put to the side. But there's some beautiful balance where, on the one hand, um, you know, you're able to take in all kinds of ideas and input, and and truly be open to it, because uh, you know, as professionals, I think sometimes we uh, uh, could come in with a kind of defensive posture, right? Here's here's the idea, here's the plan, here's the vision, or you know, or here's uh, you know, here's my color choices as an architect, or or here's my concept design, you know, and and to want to defend that. And really, you know, I, I've learned that there actually isn't a benefit to that because at the end of the day, if somebody um, is bringing something to the table that really points out a deficiency. In the approach you took, it's going to get better if you could really hear that, and uh, you know, or there's some idea like the whole history of that school um, that just wasn't present and and was just beautiful. So so truly, kind of coming in with with open ears, open mind, open heart, and being able to say, "Wow, that's that's such important information. Thank you so much for you know for bringing that to the table and allowing it to impact our thinking." And at the same time, as Nanko said, being able to also say, I hear you, but that idea doesn't really find a place in what it is that we're trying to do here, or you know, it's going to prevent us from accomplishing uh, the broader aim. Um, and that would be, I guess, my advice to anyone engaging this is, is find that balance, come in with an open heart, also kind of know, <laughs> know what your direction is and, and, you know, and somehow walk that that narrow path. Yeah, just to build a little bit off of what Stephen said, because I, I 
a lot of those themes resonated with me as I reflect back on the process. And I keep using the word process, but that's critically important because you do develop that vision of what it can be, what it should look like. You get the community's input into that. That becomes your filter or your lens through which you make all your decisions. And I think you use the word filter, Stephen. Um, and that's sort of what I heard coming through uh, what Nyamka was saying too is, well, here's what we decided CMI is as a group. And here's why we picked these colors instead of these colors. That's a really great idea. And it's a really great idea as I look through it, the lens of the vision that we just came up with. And if you can tie back to that, it's, it's more like glue. It's, it, it pulls it together. It creates that sense of ownership you mentioned, Rachel, um, where there isn't a lot of pushback. Um, in fact, there's a lot of uh, push forward. Uh, I think we actually used that term way early in the process or something like that, like uh, how to push this forward in a good way uh, to turn people from holding us back to pushing us forward um, or all rowing in the same direction. I, one of our directors uses that for analogy quite a bit with me. Um, but I really, I think the advice again, and that's the right way to frame this question is, the advice is do the dang process. It's important. It really is important. And it gives you credibility. It gives you the ability to make decisions versus finances driving your decision. It actually, if you have to look at cost savings, then you can judge not just on this is cheaper, or that's cheaper, but what's more in line with our vision. And if you don't have that, it um, becomes a, an administrative process versus an educational process. I mean, I would argue that um, sometimes when, as you said, Chuck, the finances are driving it, sometimes it's not actually finances in a broad sense, it's the short-term finances. Because um, I would argue that a school project that has a firm foundation in an engaged community and that ownership is something that probably has longevity to it. And uh, sometimes projects that um, you know, are pushed forward to get it done um, without that foundation, uh, you know, maybe the price paid today seems less, um, but they're likely to need something else much, much sooner. In some, in some way, what you have is just not going to reflect what's needed. And I think we'll encounter some form of obsolescence. You know, it may not fall down. It may be technically fine, um, but if it doesn't respond to what the context is, it's in one way or another kind of not gonna last. Um, there was one uh, one thing I wanted to add is also is that I think that you know this uh, kind of lesson, the central lesson that I learned, which is like that projects really become better and are enriched by this kind of input. I think that's an easier balance to maintain when the input you're getting is fundamentally positive or feels good. You know, like this history of that school site in DC. And that was just like great new information. What a what a wonderful thing to hear and to learn about. Sometimes the input is what you just presented to us is terrible. And this is why. And you know, sometimes that's wrong, it's misinformed or whatever, but sometimes it's actually right. And at the end of the day, no matter how hard that is to take as, you know, as a creative person as, and as a professional, um, if the project had gone ahead in that wrong way, um, it would not have been a good thing in the long, in the long term. And, and that happened on that project in Baltimore. You know, we had a scheme for how the project site was going to accept deliveries coming through certain streets in the neighborhood that made all the sense in the world from a technical and planning point of view. You know, traffic studies, the way this complicated building had to be organized, utilities, you name it. That was the right answer, it seemed to us. And we showed it to the community and they were, their reaction was, you know, at the level of, we are going to lay down in front of the bulldozers. You cannot bring trucks to that street. You don't understand how the life of this community works. So you're not taking that into account. It was hard to hear, for, hard to, for us to hear, hard for our client to hear. And to do something different was actually gonna cost more money. But it was, it was necessary. In the end, it was necessary. And again, that's maybe the hardest thing of all to be able to actually hear that and say, wow, 
someone came to the table with some good information that we just didn't have. Um, and it kind of sends us back to the drawing board, but that's actually in the benefit of the project, of the community, of this, of this school, and is going to um, give it that longevity and ownership that it otherwise would not have had. Chuck and Naimka, is there, is there something maybe in the design process or maybe just in the process of, you know, developing the school and pushing forward your vision? Is there something like that that you've experienced around, um, you know, not having information and uh, getting something that means, oh, gosh, we need to, like, really restructure this piece or that piece? Either of you. <laughs> I think we've experienced that. Um, like I said, the renovation completed right before we went into the pandemic and we've only had, um, we haven't brought all of our students back into this space. So we've only brought a, a small number. Um, so, so far we haven't experienced anything like that. Um, we'll have to wait into the fall when we bring everyone back in to see if there's some things that, you know, we didn't consider with having more um, students and staff into the space. But for right now we haven't, notice anything. Yeah, I would say not on this project where we had to make sort of a got some new information, make a hard left hand turn. Mm -hmm. But uh, in past experience with the school that won't I won't name, but they um, came into a neighborhood uh, in, the, in an area we call East the End now it's east of the river in Anacostia with a very high paid consultant who has a, a, a good name in the community. Um, or at least in parts of the community, who came in and said, we're going to give you this brand new school. It's going to be amazing. And it was, it, as Stephen was talking, I was, I was having flashbacks because I was running a school at the time just down the block from this particular project. And that the community there, uh, the school was, it was a national school that was putting a, a, a school here, um, didn't hear it the way they needed to hear it, the way that Stephen and, and sounds like Newman heard it up in Baltimore. And the community stopped the school from, they literally did stand in front of the bulldozers. You know, they thought, oh, we got this high paid quasi celebrity guy coming in and pitching this to, oh, we're gonna make this a better community. It's gonna be safer. It's gonna be da da da, good school in your community. And folks are like, you have no idea what we want. You have no idea what we need. Um, and, they stopped it. It stopped for a full year and they all, they had to come back. They ended up getting a new firm to come in and sort of handle PR and engage the community for six months before they decided to break ground, totally had to restart. Um, so I've seen those kind of things happen, um, which was one of the reasons why when you described the process here, knowing I have a very strong, empowered cohort of parents here. Um, it ranges from people who just give us their kids and they don't want them back until the end of the day to others that want to tell the teachers what to wear to work. Um, and, you know, we have, it's a balancing act, but we knew that we had to engage the, those folks again through that lens of this is what the school is about. This is our North Star. This is how we're going to educate kids. Great ideas doesn't fit. Great ideas fits great. Great idea, new learning. Um, and by doing that, it changed the process to, like Niamh said, it's been knock on wood, smooth sailing. Um, you know, everybody's come in, oh, it's beautiful. This is so much better. It feels so much better than it used to feel down here. Everybody uses the word feel um, when they walk into the building, which I think is amazing. You know, you don't, people don't walk into schools and say, it feels good in here. They're like, ah, oh, you know, now I've got to start doing my three hours. Um, here, they're like, this is fun. Like this feels good, and that's a big change. So, yeah, that's that's my example. That's great. So that trans transitions us really easily into our last question, which is, um, you know, we've talked about what the kind of your context were as we started design, as we were moving through construction. But what are you looking at, you know, in the future? What do you think are are things that might emerge, or things that might get more important as we're moving forward? Obviously, a part of that conversation is, you know, how has the pandemic been affecting you all and how do you think it's going to be affecting you next year? But I'm sure, like, given the depth of a holistic look at all of this that you all have been sharing so far, I'm sure you have things that are beyond the pandemic and, um, you know, maybe even uh, spurred on by um, 
by experiences that we've had in the last year. Nayamka, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I mentioned, we have brought some of our students back, um, who, some of our students who weren't finding success with distance learning, but in the fall, we plan to bring everyone back. Um, some of our students wouldn't have been in school for over a year, which a year and a half, and really thinking about how we're going to be ready for them when they come and really being intentional about um, we first need to ensure that from a social emotional perspective that they're ready for learning and you know thinking about how our classrooms are set up what how we're going to be welcoming them who's going to who are they going to see when they first get out of the car or walk onto campus like being really intentional about how we're welcoming students back and I think that goes back to the environment and really setting um, our students up for success when they come back into the building so that they know they feel welcome, they feel loved, and so that they'll be available for learning. So really being intentional about how we're welcoming them, welcoming them back so that they can really um, dive into that learning um, that we're excited to continue. Yeah, building off of what Nayamka said, um, there was a lot of intentional talks and conversations about um, you know what's it going to look like when they come back but also you know and, and all that was how are they going to engage that's what what I heard Nyamka saying was how are we going to give the kids the ability remove barriers for engagement encourage engagement right um, we had to do that during the pandemic as well where the learning environment was not something we could control but there were barriers as a school we could try to remove so kids could be more engaged so what you know food we learned in the pandemic that a large number of our kids and families depend on two square meals a day for school and suddenly they're stuck at home and they're short two-thirds of their meals every day so we quickly rally to create a food delivery program for free um, and what that did was it suddenly folks weren't having to scramble to find food. They were able to eat and engage in the online learning that we were doing. Um, that same kind of process we went through as we were planning the renovation is kind of the same process we went through as we were identifying those basic needs um, and how we identified which students to bring back. So again, process, process, process is critically important. Um, to identify the students came back, we did a lot of deep data dives into attendance and normative scores and summative scores and teacher observations, had a lot of conversations and you know, arguably charrettes about it, prioritizing kids. We color-coded kids um, based on their engagement um, and who needed to come back. And by doing that, the kids who are the least engaged came back first. So that'll build that culture of engagement that Niamh was talking about. We removed that barrier. We had them bring their siblings back. So it was a family experience. We were very intentional about making sure kids met all the teachers at their grade level. So when they were invited back, they may be with a teacher, you know, one of three teachers at their grade level, but they know all of them because they're, so that kind of intentional aspect of this process was really important. And I think a lesson we pulled out of the design process and applied to our thinking and our planning going forward. Um, you know, the, it'll be great to see people in the space and to see how they engage in the space and engage in learning in the space. We've been using these spaces, the renovated spaces primarily for kids to come back, but they've been across grade bands. So we'll have big kids with little kids and all that. Um, so when there's that sort of, this is my classroom, I think it's gonna be really fun to see. Um, but I think if we're always focused on the kind of education our kids deserve, the way we want to engage the community in that and remove barriers to accessing education as an inclusive environment, because that's what an inclusive environment is. It includes, there's a reason why that's the first word, the root word. Um, so if you do that now, even in the pandemic, you will continue to do it going forward. And so we've had to be very intentional as a leadership team to talk about five years down the road, as well as five months down the road, as well as five minutes from now. Because five minutes from now, one of the variants may take off and we have to shut everything down. And what's our plan for that? Five months from now, we may be able to bring back 50% of our kids. Five years from now, we may want to add a high school. Who knows? So um, having those intentional conversations and a process around it has been um, some of the learning I think we've taken away from 
this project. So thank you all for that. It's our pleasure. Um, to, to wrap off this uh, panel bit, Stephen, I just wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to add in terms of um, what you consistently see or, or some of the surprises that, that you might be seeing as, uh, as buildings are opened and as not, not just with the pandemic, but as buildings are opened after construction. And then also maybe talk about some of the conversations that you've had with others about how their reopening processes after the pandemic are going. You know, I, I had an issue with my car a few months ago. And when I brought it to my mechanic, he told me, you know, they're seeing an entirely different set of problems with vehicles than they've ever had. Because the kinds of problems that cars begin to develop when they sit around unused for months is very, very different than the kinds of problems that they have because of use. Um, so I kind of think buildings are the same story, uh, <laughs> whether they're buildings that um, we have some buildings in our practice that open just before the pandemic, you know, and typically the first year of use going through its first cycle of seasons is when um, issues are discovered and corrected, and then the building kind of goes into its operational mode. And buildings that were completed either just before the pandemic or during the pandemic simply didn't have that. And so that's, that's one issue, just the lack of ability to shake out problems in use. Um, the other is that some of them have actually developed problems from not being used, <laughs> um, just like the cars. So I think that's a new experience for, uh, for any of us, uh, you know, for us as professionals, for our clients of how to um, deal with uh, those new kinds of problems. And certainly the hope is as we ease uh, back into uh, more normal operations that that will be a thing of the past. On the other hand, as Chuck said, if this becomes something that does happen you know, with any regularity, um, perhaps we need to uh, start thinking about, uh, you know, processes for buildings that are not occupied, um, so that they don't develop these, these new kinds of issues. Um, I would say the other thing about the uh, pandemic experience really does have to do with how one engages with communities, how do you reach communities, how do you bring people together. And the honest truth is that those were always present, just not everybody realizes them. I mean, there, you know, even um, in situations where we want to be inclusive, there are important voices that are difficult to get in the room because they're working two jobs, three jobs, they don't have childcare. Um, and then of course we tend to turn to our digital tools and some people don't have access to, to the digital tools. So, I think kind of those practical issues of how do you actually bring people together in a room became very pointed during the pandemic because we couldn't bring people together. But the truth of the matter is they've always been present. And um, I don't know, I think it's encouraging in some ways to see some of the innovative tools that um, kind of came to the fore during the pandemic. And my hope is that that will enable um, somehow greater um, uh, diversity and engagement and, and ability to, to bring in a broad range of voices um, in, in our community engagement. Absolutely. I love uh, the, I've been through several, a couple of uh, community, intensive community engagement processes during the pandemic. And I love the new skills that everybody has in their ability to, to get on a call and talk with everyone. And, you know, all, all of these new tools that rolled, rolled out like mural and, you know, whiteboard and such. Um, so I really appreciate you all's time. I have a few more pretty pictures to wrap us out. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and then right at the end, we've got our self-guided workshop. There is a survey link and everyone will be receiving the slides as part of the package. Whenever you go to sign up for your session or whenever, like after you sign up for your sessions, it'll be coming to you. Um, but I do also have the questions right at the end. Um, they're a repeat of some of the questions we asked here, but also a few others. So I'm going to just put on my shared screen. I'm going to say thank you and bye to everybody because we're not going to see them again uh, in, in the big format. Um, this was really fun. I, you guys make it so easy to moderate and just like, all right, here's the question. <laughs> go, go connect, make creative connections with each other easily. So this has been really fun for me too. All right. So I'm just going to wrap up, like I said, with a few more slides. So one of the primary 
pieces that we had to take into account, like we said, was these historic conditions. So I thought everyone might want to see some of the details of the interiors and the exteriors of the building. Uh, like Chuck mentioned, this is on the AFRH campus in DC. And I've got a couple more before and afters. This is the hallway off of the core um, learning commons space. So it's an activated hallway with some activity zones put out. Uh, and as you can see, lots and lots of acoustic treatments, but done in a fun um, and kind of area defining way. One of the big conversations we had throughout the design process was how um, the teachers and staff uh, and students wanted to be out and about and doing things, but that, that it felt like maybe there was not enough structure for that. So uh, that the, a lot of the moves that we made were creating spaces for different kinds of activities. Uh, an example, this is in the main hallway going down between the north and south ends of the building. And we just have a couple of pictures. We had done a bit of studies around what how practices were changing during COVID-19. So we had on the left side, the setup for the uh, students who were in school. And then on the right side was the design setup. Um, and I did wanna mention, I, I, we've been talking all, all through this um, about you know, being on budget, being on time and how to make things flexible while, without you know, exploding. And I think a really big part of that process was the, the furniture design process, which we went through as an initial phase. And then we um, set the team up with A2S and they went through a, a furniture shredding phase of their own. And they'd like to see this model continue throughout the rest of the school um, as, as we go forward. So here is the Survey Monkey link. Like I said, it will be in the slides that you'll have access to as a part of watching this session. And here are our self-guided workshop questions. And I'm just gonna leave them up for a second. So if anybody wants to snip them and is not gonna go to the survey link, they'll have the option. And then I'll stop my share and we will wrap up. Thanks everybody. Bye.